Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries, a mysterious radio signal, a telescope in Australia. Is it magnetars or is it alien murder? Probably magnetars. Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So today I'm going to talk about an astronomical mystery called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. These have been in the news a lot lately, and people are wondering what they are. Well, the short answer is we don't know. That's it for this week. Uh, next week I'll have another video. Oh, what? Oh, we have to, okay. The long answer is that we're figuring it out. Fast radio bursts were first detected in 2007. Laura Mir and Novacek were doing an analysis of archival data from 2001, and they found an unusual signal that no one had ever seen before. This radio signal lasted only five milliseconds, but during that time, assuming any reasonable distance, it was giving out thousands or millions of times as much energy as the sun. We had never seen anything like that before. Over the last 15 years, we've discovered about 500 of these things, but we still don't have a really clear idea on what they are. We do know a few things about them. First of all, they tend to be short, lasting on the order of milliseconds or thousandths of a second. But during that brief moment when they are on, the energy they are putting out is thousands or millions of times as bright as the sun. Many appear to originate outside our Milky Way galaxy, but some may be in the local universe. Some of them are known to repeat. One in particular repeats every 16.35 days. And the news was just filled with a stunning revelation from a research group in China that they found an FRB that went off hundreds of times in the span of 60 hours. Now, this isn't the first time we've confronted this kind of astronomical mystery. In the 1960s, radio surveys began to detect radio emissions from what seemed to be stars. That was unexpected. Stars put out most of their light in the ultraviolet or the optical, and so seeing radio light from stars was unexpected. So they were called quasi-stellar objects or quasars. Their energy distribution, the amount of light they were putting out in the X-ray, infrared, ultraviolet, and so on, was unlike anything we had ever seen before. What's more, they varied dramatically over the course of days or even weeks. Finally, we found out that these things were very far away, so whatever was producing the energy had to be very energetic. Eventually, what we figured out was that all big galaxies have massive black holes in their cores. And when I say massive, I mean millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. Our own Milky Way has a black hole in its core that is about four million times the mass of the sun. Now in the nearby universe, most of these black holes are inactive. We can't see them because they're black. But in other galaxies, they are in the process of devouring vast clouds of gas and dust, maybe even entire stars and star systems. When they do that, the material doesn't just fall right into the black hole. What it does is form this compact, extremely hot, swirling, chaotic accretion disk around the black hole, which consistently feeds material into the black hole. And that bright, variable accretion disk is what we were seeing. And this is now a very broad and active area of research in astronomy called active galaxies. Another mystery that I have somewhat of a connection to is gamma ray bursts. In the 1960s, we launched this constellation of satellites called Vela. These were gamma ray detectors. Gamma rays are the highest energy form of light and are only produced by the most energetic events such as nuclear explosions or hulks. We put these up in space to monitor the Soviet Union's compliance with the nuclear test ban treaty. Well, they began detecting flashes of gamma rays, but those flashes were coming from the cosmos, not from Earth. And this set off a three decade long debate over what exactly these things were. Eventually, new telescopes were designed that could communicate with the ground and astronomers could follow these things up very quickly and we figured out what they were. What they are is the birth pangs of black holes. There are actually two types of gamma ray bursts. The first type is what we call a short gamma ray burst, which lasts less than two seconds. In this case, you have two neutron stars. These are the shriveled husks of massive stars that exploded in supernovae. A neutron star is 1.4 times the mass of the sun, maybe the size of a small city, and could spin up to hundreds of times a second. If you have two of these things orbiting each other, they will eventually merge and create a vast explosion. This is a short gamma ray burst, and the remnant behind is a black hole. Now, other times you may have a massive star that goes up in a supernova and leaves a black hole behind. This is called a long GRB and lasts anywhere up to hundreds of seconds. In both cases, what produces the gamma ray burst is that the energy release is highly collimated. It is preferentially blown along two jets along the north and south pole of the system. And it's like a lighthouse. If that jet is pointed at us, 
we will see that flash of gamma rays, we will see a gamma ray burst. Now, this isn't just interesting history. The techniques we use to figure out active galaxies and gamma ray bursts are the same ones we're using to figure out FRBs. We may not know what they are, but we have some ideas. First of all, they have to be small. These things can change on the time scale of milliseconds. If they were huge, if they were say hundreds of light years across and something changed that said, send out radio light, send out radio light, it would take hundreds of years for that signal to propagate out into whatever this is and cause it to brighten in the radio. And then whatever signal said, get dim, get dim, would uh, take hundreds of years to spread out as well. So the fact that they can change so quickly means they have to be small. They have to be on the scale, not of light years, but of light milliseconds. We also know that they are extremely energetic. As I mentioned, they can outshine the sun for that brief time they are active. Now, there are only a few known objects that are compact enough and energetic enough to produce this kind of signal. And most of these are stellar remnants like black holes, white dwarfs, and neutron stars. And most of the theories favor something of that nature. One of the most popular explanations right now are magnetars. Magnetars are like those neutron stars I described, only in this case, they have a magnetic field that is quadrillions of times stronger than the magnetic field of the Earth. If you stood on the surface of a magnetar and held a compass, the magnetic field would be so strong it would atomize the compass. Of course, the gravity is so intense you would be crushed down to an atom-thick smear on the surface anyway, so losing your compass would be the least of your problems. When you have that much magnetic energy bound up in something that small, even tiny changes can release tremendous amounts of it. One of the ways we detect magnetars is that they occasionally experience a star quake. The surface of the magnetar shifts and resettles a little bit. And even though this is a tiny change, because that magnetic field is so intense, it releases a gigantic amount of energy. In fact, these things are so bright, we will detect them tens of thousands of light years away. In 2004, a magnetar 50,000 light years had a star quake and gave off an explosion so powerful, we could measure the effects of it on our atmosphere and we could detect the reflection of that energy wave off the moon. A couple of years ago, one of these FRBs was traced to a known magnetar. So that's the solution, right? Solved. Well, not quite. First of all, even if we accept that these things are produced by magnetars, we don't really understand the mechanism. We don't understand what exactly is going on with the magnetar that causes these FRBs to go off. And we still haven't traced all of them to no magnetars. There may be that like gamma ray bursts, we're looking at multiple things that just have an observational signal. FRBs are defined by the observational signal, not by the physical phenomenon producing it. And so you may have different physical phenomena that can produce the same signal. So magnetars are definitely part of the equation here, but it may be something else too. And that something else is what gets a lot of attention, particularly the idea that it might be an alien civilization. Now, I'm not going to say that we can definitively say this isn't aliens, because the number of alien civilizations we have surveyed is zero. It is very unlikely that this is aliens because of the sheer amount of energy that needs to be produced. You really need something astrophysical to produce that kind of energy but I'm not gonna completely rule it out. If you told someone 200 years ago that we'd have a single bomb that would vaporize an entire city, they would have thought that was physically impossible. So I'm not gonna say it's absolutely ruled out, but it is unlikely that this is aliens. But what's really cool about FRBs is they're a reminder that notwithstanding all the triumphs of 20 and 20th century astronomy, figuring out how stars live and die, figuring out the expansion of the universe and the fate of the universe, there's still a lot we don't know. And there may be even more that we don't know we don't know. 15 years ago, we didn't even know that FRBs existed. And now they're an active area of research. Every year we're bringing on new instruments, new capabilities, new ways of looking at the universe beyond even light now with gravitational waves and neutrino detectors and other particle experiments. And we keep finding new phenomena, things we did not expect. Every time we expand our capabilities, every time we broaden our vision, the universe gets more vast and more complicated and more amazing than we thought it was before. And so that's what this is really all about. So I, I'm hoping that in five to 10 years, I can come on this channel and say, hey, we've explained FRBs. I, actually, I hope I still have a channel in five to 10 years. So hit that subscribe button and spread the word that you, if you like this. But what I'm really hoping for is in five to 10 years, I could come here with another mystery we need to solve. Something else we've discovered that we have no explanation for. 
because figuring out the universe is really fun. That's why scientists do what they do. But what's really fun is figuring out that you don't have it all figured out. Sorry, I didn't have a video the last time. Uh, I had a cold and my voice wasn't good. Next week, I'm going to get into something a little bit more fun in the movie direction again. In the meantime, uh, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.